Well, if we haven't had the chance to meet, I'm Robbie Itterberg. I'm one of the pastors. And as we get into the message this morning, I'm wondering, what is your greatest gift? What is your greatest strength, your greatest ability? I got to confess that this is the time of year where my mind starts wandering to the NFL football season (laughs) and to fantasy football that goes along with it. And in fantasy football circles, it is commonly the best ability uh, in those circles is commonly called availability, right? That of all the things a player can bring to the game, the best thing, the thing they have to be is available. And we know that that's true in our lives, right? It's the foundational ability for every setting and every situation. We've got to show up. We've got to be available. I'm confident if you don't show up for work that they're going to get pretty tired of paying you soon, right? And I'm confident if you don't show up in your relationships, your friends and family are going to assume that you have abandoned them. If you don't show up, you won't be carrying your responsibilities. You will miss out on invitations, experiences, and opportunities. we got to keep showing up. It's fundamental. It's a necessity for our lives. It's also a necessity for our relationship with God. And yet, we don't always keep showing up, do we? We're going to talk about this this morning as we continue our sermon series that we've been in for a little while called Just Like Us, Ordinary People Changing the World. It's a series where we're looking at the 12 apostles, those 12 guys that Jesus called to be with him, that he gave authority to heal and cast out demons, that he also gave the authority that comes with the message of the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God. And these 12 ordinary guys, through them, God changed the world, and we are the inheritors of that authority and that message. And so each week, we're looking at these 12 guys, one of the 12, and discovering what can we learn about being with Jesus and being sent out by Jesus. And so this morning, we're going to jump into Mark chapter 15 as we think about showing up. And so if you want, you can follow along on the screen, but let's listen for God's word speaking to us this morning. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, He's calling Elijah. Someone ran with a sponge filled with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the lesser, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, in this moment as we seek to be here, to show up and hear what you have to say. We ask that you would send your spirit to open our minds, our ears, our hearts, that there would be understanding, there would be responsiveness, that, Lord, you would shape us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we were reading that passage, you may have been wondering, okay, which of the 12 apostles are we talking about? right? Where, where is he? And we got to the end of the passage, and you might have been going, which of the 12 apostles are we talking about, and where is he? Because it was easy to pass over quickly, right? Today, we're looking at James, who was briefly mentioned. James, who is called the son of Alphaeus in the lists of the 12 apostles. In this passage, in verse 40, 
what we heard was among the women who were watching as Jesus was crucified was a woman named Mary, the mother of James, the lesser, and of Joseph. And I got to tell you, that's it. That's all the detail that we get in the entire Bible about James. He's the son of Alphaeus, the son of Mary, and he has a nickname. He's called the lesser. So, so where do we go with this? Right? There's not a lot of detail, but this little detail that's in here, I do think helps us understand some profound truth about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. He's called the, the lesser. In Greek, the word is actually mikros, and it could mean a few different things, but you can already maybe hear in it, that's where we get our whole family of words that have, have micro in them, so microwave, microchip, microcosm. You can already understand that this word means it has something to do with small, right? And so some think that James might have been a small guy, right? Maybe he was short, slight in his stature. So he might, this might have been a nickname like shorty or tiny. The word also could mean younger. And, and so James is known perhaps as the younger as opposed to the other James that we talked about a few weeks ago, James the son of Deb Zebedee, who was probably the older because this James is called the younger. The word could also have to do with influence and impact on people and on the world. And so thinking about this, how would you like to be known as James, the young short guy who didn't make much of a difference in the world? That's basically what we get here. This is the description. This is our guy. There's nothing about him that's particularly noteworthy. No accomplishments. There's not even any questions. No epic failures. Right? He's just this guy who was called by Jesus to be among the twelve. John MacArthur is a pastor and an author, and he wrote a book called 12 Ordinary Men, which is all about the apostles. I'd recommend it to you. But in it, he says this about James. He says, it may well be that all these things were true of James, so that he was a small, young, quiet person who stayed mostly in the background. Not a lot to say about it. He was in the background. But don't miss that. He was in the background. Don't miss the importance of this little fact. He kept showing up over and over. He was available. He was with Jesus throughout Jesus' ministry. We see in the book of Acts that he keeps showing up after Jesus' resurrection because they only had to replace one apostle to get back to 12, and we know for sure that the apostle they replaced was Judas, so James was still showing up even then. And so, what was, what's the significance of showing up? What's it look like? I think it's not often what we think about when we think of the apostles, right? We tend to think of these guys as incredible heroes of faith with these incredible accomplishments and stories of their faithfulness. But we don't see any of that with James. James. It's showing up, we find, with James is not about success. It's not about achievement. It's not about ambition. James seems to be content. A lot like that psalm, Psalm 131, that we read earlier. He seems to be content. He said he's quieted himself like a weaned child with its mother. Now, a child that is not weaned and is hungry and with its mother is not a pretty sight. Right? This, this is a frantic child that will scratch and claw and bite and scream, demanding attention until finally being satisfied. But what we see here is James is not frantically thrashing about through life, striving after grabbing, clawing for accolades or pats on the back or positions of privilege and comfort and power. He's not thrashing after the things that we so often get caught up with. And it doesn't mean that James is just going through the motions either. Right? It's not like he's just physically there, but his heart isn't in it. If you've seen the movie Click with Adam Sandler, he's a, a very successful architect and has a, an incredible family and is struggling to kind of make it all fit together as the demands at work increase. 
Until one day, he's given this magical universal remote control that gives him the ability to fast forward through life. And so, there's moments that he can fast forward, so he has a conflict with his wife. Wife, click, fast forward, conflict over. (laughs) Extra demands at work, click, fast forward, work is done. Right? He thinks this is an amazing gift that's been given. He gets to skip the hard and the annoying and the boring parts of life. I mean, doesn't it sound amazing? And at one point, we get a glimpse of what he looks like during those times he has pushed fast forward. You get this picture at the dinner table where the whole family's gathered around, and there he is sitting at the table, but his expression is like this empty expression. He's there, and he's shoving food in his mouth, and he's interacting with everyone at the table, but it's emotionless, it's robotic, He's not because he's not actually there. He fast-forwarded himself out of the moment. See, and James isn't going through the motions like that. He's not physically there, but thinking about all the places he'd rather be, the things that he'd rather be doing. Because when you show up, you show up with your whole self. James was showing up to the best of his ability with his whole self, not just physically there, but mentally there. Perhaps wrestling with the things that Jesus was teaching, the things that he couldn't quite understand, the questions that Jesus was asking him. He was showing up emotionally, addressing the reality of his confusion, having to deal with their collective failure as disciples over and over again, his own fear as the opposition to Jesus continues to rise and grow all around them. To the best of his ability, he's present spiritually, grappling with who is Jesus and what is he showing them about the Father and what it means to be in relationship with him. See, James is showing up with his whole self, surrendered to Jesus, expectant of change, that things are going to happen, open to what Jesus was going to do and what Jesus was then also going to ask of him, his whole being. He's probably living out the phrase that was coined by pastor and author Eugene Peterson in the book of the same title, a long obedience in the same direction. See, this is what it means to keep showing up as a follower of Jesus continuing to show up to the best of our ability with our whole self, open to what Jesus wants to do, what he's asking us to do, continuing to live out obediently the path marked out for us. And this is James with Jesus continuing to show up. We don't always keep showing up, do we? Why don't we keep showing up? I, mean, I think some of the time it's we really, really want to, but we also don't want to. Right? There, there are things that we want to do, things that we have to do, and we want to follow Jesus, and we feel torn, and so frequently in those situations we intend to follow, but we often put it off and procrastinate until we can make it fit. Jesus had this reality in his own ministry. There was a day where he was walking along, and a man comes up to him and says, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus is like, yeah, I'm not so sure about that. You know, foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man doesn't have anywhere to lay his head. He knows the man's concerned about his security and comfort. Jesus sees another man and invites him to follow him, but the man replies, well, let me go and bury my father first. Well, here's the thing. Dad was probably still alive because in Jesus' day, they would have buried almost immediately. And so he's saying to Jesus, yeah, yeah, I'll follow you, but someday after my dad dies. I'll get to it, but not today. Still another man comes to Jesus and tells him, Lord, I'll follow you, but first let me go say goodbye to my family. Right? There's all sorts of reasons that they were coming up with and that we have for why we can't sh- keep showing up for Jesus day in and day out. We have so many demands, so many responsibilities, so many hopes and desires. Yeah, Jesus, I'll show up when things finally calm down. When I'm out of this season of life or this day that is particularly busy, it's easy to put off showing up. 
And maybe it's easy because we don't always find that we're going to get anything out of showing up for Jesus immediately. And our lives are built on getting something out of every moment, isn't it? Our lives are built on the instant gratification model. What we can get out right now. What I want, when I want it, how I want it, where I want it. See, and God doesn't work that way. Don't get me wrong, God is gracious. And I think especially in early days of your relationship with Jesus, He may show up more like that. I remember my early days of following Jesus. So often I would just show up and and God was so good to me that when I'd show up in any way in in prayer or in Bible study or I'd go to a campus uh, campus ministry meeting or go to worship in church, it was like fireworks were going off, that God was meeting me right there and He was constantly blessing me with something new. And it was an incredible gift. And I think it was a gift for that particular season. It was God's way of showing me that, no, this isn't just an accident. This isn't, you didn't have some hallucination when you were kneeling in your dorm room and I showed up to you and you gave your life to me. It wasn't just some figment of your imagination. No, God continued to show up over and over again to nurture my faith. And over time, that was taken away. And not that it's gone completely, but it's not the same that it once was. It was that gift for that season. And I think this is part of God's plan because it's part of how he matures us. He doesn't just keep giving us and giving us and giving us what we want because he knows that if that happens, we will just keep demanding and demanding and demanding. Like immature children, that we just get something else and get it now. And for some of us, this is why we stop showing up. We, we stop showing up because we're disappointed that God didn't give us what we wanted or what we thought we needed in the moment. The thing is, if we stop showing up for God because we're disappointed that we didn't get what we wanted or we needed, what it really demonstrates is that we're not trusting in Jesus as the reason we have access to the Father. We're not really trusting that Jesus is the reason that God would bless us and would provide for us. We're trusting ourselves. We're essentially trusting that I'm good enough, I'm worthy enough, so that God, when I show up, you should give me stuff. Now, we don't say that consciously, but we're really acting like, hey God, I'm here, you're welcome. But God doesn't need us that way. And so part of this long obedience in the same direction is to keep showing up for Jesus even when it doesn't feel like we're getting anything from Jesus right now. And the thing is, showing up is, is hard, isn't it? But Jesus actually never tried to tell us otherwise. As a matter of fact, Jesus' invitation was to come and take up your cross daily and follow me, to die to yourself, right? He promised his disciples that, hey, the world hates me, and if you're my follower, guess what they're going to feel about you? They're going to hate you too. And this invitation to follow Jesus is to walk how he walked, to live how he lived, to suffer as Jesus has suffered, and it's hard. It's hard just, yes, because that persecution can be hard. Yes, it's hard because it's exhausting. But it's also hard to continue to fall on our faces and fail, isn't it? It's hard to face the embarrassment. It's hard to live a life intentionally examining ourselves constantly and confessing where we've come up short like we do each and every week when we gather and we have our prayer of confession and there's times I'm just exhausted of having to constantly talk about my failure. I just don't want to do this confession thing anymore. It's exhausting to keep showing up and realizing that I don't have in myself what it takes to even do the things that Jesus is asking me to do. I can't change people's hearts. I can't change people's minds. I can't bring healing. I can't overcome my own temptation and manage myself. So it's hard to keep showing up and we just kind of want to hit that fast forward button. 
And sometimes we don't want to show up because we're not really sure who's going to show up with us. Who else is going to be there? You know, so, some of us have that challenge when we're invited to go to so, a party or somewhere else, and we're like, who else is going to be there? I'm not sure because I don't know if I'm going to know anyone. And, and Jesus is inviting us to come, and, and the reality is not really to come and go it alone. He's inviting us to come with a group of people, other followers of him. He gathered the 12 to him. He sent them out by two. And some of the times we're like, yeah, I'm not sure who'll be there. And you know what? I may not like them. They may not like me. They may act differently, think differently, believe differently, smell differently. Like it could just be really uncomfortable. I'd rather it just be me and you, Jesus. But that's not the way Jesus operates. He's not calling us to just live in some sort of bubble with him. He is calling us to live deeply in community with other followers of Jesus. And that can be hard because people can be annoying. And it can be difficult to live in community with those who are different with us that we may not even like. And this was true for the 12 apostles. They didn't all like each other either. We're going to look at that a little bit more in upcoming weeks. But James keeps showing up. He resists the procrastination. Even when he's not getting anything in the moment, when it gets hard, when he doesn't really like the people that he's with, he keeps showing up. Oh, and that is until Jesus was arrested. And then the 12 scattered, including James. It was too much. Their expectations were disappointed too completely. Their fear was too overwhelming. But you, did you see who did keep showing up? Did you see in our passage who kept showing up? Mom. Mom. Mom and the other women kept showing up. They were there caring for Jesus throughout his ministry. They were there at the crucifixion. They showed up. James's mom is one of the women who witnesses the resurrection before the apostles. The women kept showing up. And mom may have been the reason that James showed up in the first place. It may have been her faith in this God who in history had liberated his people, who had promised a Messiah who would bring healing and redemption and forgiveness and restoration. Her faith in this Messiah passed to her son may have been the reason he shows up in the first place. The power of the family of faith. So James showed up until he didn't. Kind of like all of us. And it's in that gap where we fail to show up, in that gap where we give up, where we throw in the towel, it's in that gap where Jesus shows up for us. It's in that gap where he stepped forward and offered himself on a cross. He showed up even when it meant showing up would be, he would be forsaken on that cross, crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus, the Christ, the eternal Son of God, forsaken by the Father, because in that moment, he took on our selfishness, our fear, our pride, our sin, our abandonment of God and failure to keep showing up. Jesus took it on, and he was abandoned, and he was forsaken, so that we could be sure that when we show up and when we don't feel like God is there, we will know even then that we are not forsaken. Because this moment on this cross is your assurance that God will never leave you or forsake you. Eugene Peterson in the, in the long, a long Obedience in the same direction said this, He said, the central reality for Christians is the personal, unalterable, persevering commitment God makes to us. Perseverance is not the result of our determination. It is the result of God's faithfulness. See, the central reality for Christians, for a follower of Jesus, is not your faith, is not your commitment, your goodness, your perseverance. It's not your showing up. The central reality for the Christian is God's commitment, God's faithfulness, God's perseverance, God's endurance, God's showing up for you. 
And we won't keep showing up by some sort of white-knuckle effort, especially when things get hard. But we will show up when we realize we are responding to a God who has shown up for us even to the point of death on a cross. And then we can show up expectant and open and willing to be obedient to whatever Jesus wants to do and wherever he wants us to go. So what does it look like practically to keep showing up? I mean, I think it means to keep showing up to God in prayer, day in and day out in each moment. Even when you feel like your prayers are just going up against a brick wall and you feel dry and you feel exhausted, it's to continue to show up in prayer. To realize in that season, perhaps he is maturing you and maturing your desires. That he's continuing a good work. It's to continue to show up to him in in the Bible, in reading, even when you find the Bible boring and hard to understand, when you don't feel like you're getting anything out of it. And I tell you, there are lots of mornings where I get up and I am reading in the Bible and I don't get anything out of it. It's not like filling up a tank of gas that just because I sit in that chair and just because I read it, I'm going to automatically feel like there's been this epiphany kind of moment and encounter with God. Now, some mornings, it breaks through all of the clutter and God speaks with such clarity that it'll almost knock me over. There's lots of days where it's just about showing up. It means continuing to show up in groups and in places where there are other followers of Jesus even those that you may find difficult, who are challenging for you to be with. It's continuing to show up in worship, even when you're not getting anything out of it. Worship is is part of the picture. It's not the whole picture. Don't get me wrong. Showing up for Jesus, you can't fully show up for God without continuing to gather to worship, but it's not fully, fully showing up if all you're doing is gathering to worship. It means also continuing to show up in service, to go wherever Jesus is calling you to go, to serve whomever Jesus is calling you to serve, even when it seems like no one else is willing to serve. Maybe you can invite somebody to come serve with you, and then you won't be going it alone. And maybe you could even choose somebody you like that might even make it more fun. But don't shortchange yourself. Don't shortchange what Jesus has for you. Don't procrastinate. Don't give up. Don't give in. James wasn't special because of what he did, because of his success, because of his faith. He was special because Jesus called him to show up, and when he showed up, he saw everything that Jesus did, and it changed everything for him. Keep showing up. Don't try to cut corners. Tony Evans tells the story of a woman in 1980 who ran the Boston Marathon. And this woman started out the race strong, and then as the end of the race came, it was kind of this miraculous ending. She wins the Boston Marathon and sets an incredible record. And everybody was surprised and a little bit confused because here was this woman nobody had ever heard of. She had never won a marathon before, but here she is winning the Boston Marathon. So it didn't smell quite right, and they kept looking into it further, and what they discovered is, yes, this woman started the race, started strong, but eventually, somewhere along the line, left the course, went into the subway, took the train for 16 miles, popped out of the subway, got back on the course, and then finished the race. She wins! Right? She wanted to skip the middle. She wanted to skip the hard part. She wanted to skip everything that makes it worth winning the race in the end. She didn't want to keep showing up step after step after step in the mundane details of a 26.2 mile race. Keep showing up, even when it's hard, even when you don't understand what God is up to. Keep showing up and see what Jesus wants to do, profound and wonderful things, and it will change everything for you. Keep showing up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we... We thank you for this obscure, kind of unknown apostle, James the Lesser. 
God, I thank you for him. I thank you, Jesus, that you called him and that there was nothing special about him to even take note of. (laughs) God, that's so us. Thank you that as we look at him, we can see that you also call us to just keep showing up. But Lord, there are so many reasons we don't. So many disappointments, so much frustration, so much busyness, so many things in our lives, so much fear, so much inconvenience, so much uh, of being with people that are difficult to be with because their work's in progress just like we are. Lord, it's hard. We acknowledge our desire even to quit. Lord, will you bless us? with a greater sense of your commitment to us, that we would be responding to you showing up for us by simply showing up day in and day out in each moment, that we'd be open to Jesus let you have your way. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.